Good morning and welcome to Connect Church Online. We're so glad that you're here. We're coming to you live-ish from Confederation Park. It's a beautiful day. You're probably at home in your living room, but you might also be at one of our official watch parties. I had a great time at our family reunion picnic a couple weeks ago. Some of you were there, but if you're like me, it just wasn't quite enough. So watch parties, if you're missing your church family, if you want to meet some new people, they're the place to be. We have multiple throughout the city. There's one in Evanston, there's one in Skyview, there's even one uh, down south by Chinook Mall. So go and check them out. Go to connectcalgary.ca slash watch. Well, there's all the information there and you can register for a watch party today. I know I'm a little biased, but I love watching these services on Sunday mornings. But do you ever get stuck watching something that is either a little too old or a little too young for you? Maybe you're at grandma's house and she's watching Jeopardy and she just refuses to change that channel. Or your kid is trying to explain to you what a TikTok is and you have no clue. Well, your kids don't have to feel that way on Sunday mornings and we don't leave them out. We have video lessons and fun activities for them for kids that are either in preschool or elementary that are age appropriate and relevant and that they are gonna have a ton of fun with. So go and check that out. Just go to connectcalgary.ca, click on kids, and we've got everything there step-by-step, step, walk you through it. Now we'll turn it to Pastor Dan for another installment of Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus tells us what to do if you get a log stuck in your eye. A couple of days ago, I came across an article asking, how well do you speak the language of Generation Z? And in the article, you had to define 23 words that millennials and Gen Z use. Now, I'm just shy of my 40th birthday, which just barely makes me a Gen Xer. But I also feel like I'm pretty in the know when it comes to stuff like this, so I took the quiz. Now, before I tell you how I did, let's see if you know a couple of the definitions of the words in this article article. The first word is lit. Do you know what it means if something is lit? Probably. It means amazing, high energy, and generally pretty great. An example might be, this chicken pot pie is lit. All right, here's your second word. Stan. Any ideas what it means to be a stan? A stan is a combination of the words stalker and fan. It means to eagerly support or pursue someone or something. So somebody who's in Gen Z might say, these mosquitoes have been standing me all day long. I'm pretty sure I'm using that right. Okay, final word. Let's see if you know this Gen Z vocabulary. Ready? The word is cap. Have you ever heard somebody use the word cap before? Cap is another word for lie. So you might say, bro, Chris took my hat today. And your friends would say, no cap? And you would say, no cap. Out of 23 words, I ended up getting 20 of them right. So low key, I felt pretty good about myself. Dink and flicka. All right, why do I bring all of this up? Well, one, to make you feel old, but also because I think there's a word that occurs in the next section of the Sermon on the Mount that is used all the time, but I don't think people actually understand what it means, or at least they don't understand it the way that Jesus used it. But here's the thing. If we were to understand what Jesus says, then we might actually change our perspective on things. What he says is so important and so helpful that if we were to start to put it into practice, it would completely change what the world thinks about Christians. We could have healthier relationships with the people in our families, at work, or even online. Wouldn't that be great? And it all hinges on one simple five letter word. So let's see if you can pick out this five letter word as Simone reads for us, Matthew chapter number seven, verses one through five. Do not judge others and you will not be judged for you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite, first get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Were you able to figure out which word people so often misunderstand and misuse? I bet you did. The word is judge. This is a word that most people think they understand, but here's the truth. 
both people inside of the church and people outside of the church have totally misunderstood what Jesus meant when he said, do not judge. It's been pointed out that over the last 50 to 60 years, this may be the most quoted verse in the entire Bible. I believe that's probably true. You know, people outside of the church will often quote this verse at Christians as a way to shut down any discussion of morality or values. They'll say things like, your own book says, do not judge judge. And then Christians will lean on this verse so that they don't have to make difficult decisions or calls on what people around them are doing in the world. They kind of have this, well, who am I to judge sort of attitude. In our modern world, we've understood Jesus to mean, when he says, do not judge, we've understood him to mean, hey, you do you and let them do them. Nobody has any right to judge anybody else based on their actions, beliefs, or values. But let me tell you, that is not what Jesus meant here in Matthew chapter number seven. And we know that's not what he meant because first of all, that's an impossible way to live. Life is nothing but a series of choices. And every time you make a choice, you have to judge or you have to discern what is the right thing or what is the wrong thing. What is the right choice and what is the wrong choice? There's no way to make a decision without also discerning or judging. If you go on a date with someone, you're judging whether this is someone that you share interests and values with. And hey, you're judging whether you think they're attractive or not. You are discerning whether you should say yes to a second date. You know, if you're interviewing somebody to be uh, an employee in your business, you are judging whether or not they would be a good fit for your company. If you're buying a used car on Kijiji, you have to make judgments based on whether you trust that what the seller is telling you is true about the vehicle. So Jesus is certainly not telling us to give up all judgment any sort of critical thinking, to not make any decisions based on values or judgments. No, that's not at all what he means. But another reason that we're sure that Jesus isn't giving us a blanket ban on judgment is that he goes on to offer further explanation of what he does and doesn't mean over the next four verses. You see, if Jesus only spoke verse number one in which he says, do not judge so that you will not be judged, then perhaps we could assume that Jesus is simply saying, mind your own business. But although Jesus starts out by saying, do not judge, he then goes on to say, this is how you should judge. So either Jesus is speaking nonsense and he doesn't even realize that he's contradicted himself in the same verse, or he's speaking about a different kind of judgment altogether. You see, the word judge has two meanings in Greek. The first meaning is to analyze something and then to determine your position as a result of that analyzing. The second meaning is to condemn or to pass final judgment on someone or something. So when Jesus says, do not judge in verse number one, he is using that second meaning. He is saying, do not condemn. Do not presume to climb on the bench and to pronounce someone as accepted or rejected by God, saved or unsaved, evil or good. Do not claim for yourself an authority or a role that is reserved by God himself. You know, there's a parallel verse in 1 Corinthians chapter number 4, verse 5, and it says this, don't make judgments about anyone ahead of time before the Lord returns on judgment day, for he will bring our darkest secrets to light and reveal even our private motives. It is God who will give each one whatever is due. We might put the principle like this. You are called to be a judge, but you are not called to be the judge. This is especially important for people who have followed God for a long time. There's a paradox in spirituality. You see, the better you are at obeying the words of Jesus, the easier it can be to forget the heart of Jesus. Why is it that judgmental is the first word that so many people associate with Christians? Well, too often it's because we forget that there is a final judge, but it is not me. We get the sense that we know God so well that we could sit in his chair and pass judgment in the way that only he is supposed to. In verses two through five, Jesus tells us why we should not condemn others, why we shouldn't judge them in this way, even when the issue or the person, it seems very obvious to us. The first reason is because we're all fallen. 
Fallen is just a word that means we're as guilty of sin as anybody else is. There is not a single person on the planet who's not guilty of breaking God's laws. Not you, not me, not your grandma, not the Pope. In fact, in Romans chapter number three, the scripture tells us no one is righteous, not even one person. No one is truly wise. No one seeks God as they should. All have turned away. All have wandered. No one does only good, not a single one. So there's a problem here when fallen people try to condemn other fallen people. You're both guilty. Lawbreakers or criminals don't judge other criminals. That's the authority of the judge. And so when we start to pass this sort of judgment on other people, we have to recognize that we're fallen and we are just as guilty as they are. Jesus says that you're going to be judged, I'm going to be judged, and that the true judge will use the same standards on you that you wanted to use on others. So if you're quick to condemn, why shouldn't God be quick to condemn you? If you judge others harshly, then why shouldn't God judge you harshly as well? If despite your sin, you feel justified in condemning others, how much more justified would a perfect judge be in condemning you? But listen, you don't want God to give you justice. You want God to give you mercy. And that's what you've got to be willing to give others as well. They are fallen and so are you. They need grace and mercy, and so do you. You cannot demand that others are judged according to the letter of the law, and you be judged according to a spirit of grace. You can't have it both ways. There's a well-known preacher who once said, we shouldn't condemn others simply because they sin differently than we do. We can't condemn the people in the world around us, even if they're doing something that seems so obviously wrong to us because we're fallen, just like they are. The second reason that Jesus says we shouldn't sit in condemnation of others is that not only are we fallen, but we're also fallible. We don't have the knowledge or experience in order to render an accurate judgment of others. You know, our personal biases and our hidden sins, our limited perspectives, they prevent us from rendering a just decision. And sometimes the things that we think today we understand by tomorrow we might have a different opinion. How many times have you been so certain about something in your life only to learn a new piece of information or to get a little older and a little wiser and suddenly your perspective changes and you see this situation or this person differently than you did before? You are a fallible creature and that means you cannot pronounce infallible judgments on other people. True justice requires an infallible judge and there is one, but it isn't us. So Jesus summarizes both of these truths, that we are both fallen and fallible in this memorable parable in verse number three. He says, uh, imagine that your wife calls you up on the phone and she says, honey, I've got a piece of dust that's stuck in my eye and it's driving me crazy. And you say, okay, come to the garage and I'll see if I can help you out. And when she walks into the garage, see, she sees you standing there with a giant two by four sticking out of your eye. If you offer to help her get that little piece of dust out of her eye, she's going to say, forget the speck in my eye. We need to go to the hospital. And then if you say, oh, this, this, this is nothing. Don't worry about it. She's going to say, uh, listen, we have to deal with this. You're not going to be able to help me until somebody helps you. And of course, she's totally right. See, Jesus says, if you will deal with the log in your own eye, then you will be able to see clearly to help other people with their problems. Jesus says we are fallen and we are fallible. And so we need to be very careful about pronouncing judgment on other people around us, particularly when we have the same struggles that they do. So according to Matthew 7 here, these are the characteristics and qualities that should be true of Christians. The first is self-awareness, a recognition of your own fallibility and fallenness. And then this self-awareness should lead to self-judgment. We aren't focused on others because we know there's enough in our own hearts and lives that needs to be dealt with. And this is exactly in line with what 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse 31 tells us. If we would more honestly judge ourselves, God would not have to judge us so directly. 
Self-awareness then gives way to self-judgment. And through a process of self-judgment, finally, you'll be able to move into selfless service of other people. So let me end with two principles that uh, I think we can um, take from Matthew chapter number seven here. And the first is this, Christians should be more concerned with our own sins than with the sins of others. There's a lot to dislike about our culture. There's no denying that. Whether it's politics or the constantly changing values of our society, whether it's the glorification of sex and violence or any other number of issues, it can be very easy to pick out all the things that we don't like in the world or the people around us. But Jesus says, I don't need to focus on them. I need to focus on me. That I need to be asking the question, What are the logs in my own eye, not the splinters in the eyes of everyone else? Listen, this self-awareness is so hard, but it is so very beneficial. Christians should be more concerned with their own sin than with the sins of the world around them. Maybe you could ask this question. You might ask, what do I wish that they would do? Whoever they is, whoever you're frustrated with, angry with, it could be somebody you know personally, could be somebody that you only see through media. What do I wish that they would do? And if you find yourself saying, well, I wish that they would apologize or repent or repay or reconsider or forgive or be more gracious or more understanding, maybe you ought to examine yourself. Maybe I ought to examine my own heart and mind and decide whether or not I need to do those things myself. Because Jesus teaches us that we should be more concerned with our own sin as opposed to the sins of others. We should be more concerned about our own sins in prayer than we complain about the sins of others in prayer. Come on, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It is so easy to complain and grumble and list everything that everyone has done wrong to you recently. And yet prayer is the time for us to examine our own hearts and to confess the ways in which we've fallen short. We've offended, we've broken God's commands, whatever that might be. Christians are more concerned with their own sin than with the sins of the world around them. The second thing that I think we can learn from Jesus' words here in Matthew 7 is that Christians care for sinners rather than condemning them. Why? Because we're all sinners. I am just as broken and flawed and imperfect and need help as everybody else. And listen, Jesus cared for me rather than condemning me. This is the gospel. Even though I had transgressed, broken the rules, I had sinned, Jesus still loved me. He sacrificed himself on my behalf. Rather than condemning me, God cared for me. And he asks me to do the same for the world around me. I have to give the other people in the world the same thing that God has given to me. And listen, you've got to understand this is true. You can't win someone if you condemn them, you know? If we want to show the world Jesus, if we want to show them how loving and good and gracious God is, then we have to be those things ourselves. Our desire to police the world without policing ourselves, our tendency to condemn people without lifting a finger to help them is unchristlike, and it pushes them further away from the Savior. So listen, the next time your liberal aunt posts something on Facebook, ask, how can I care for her? rather than condemn her in the comments? The next time your spouse fails to live up to your expectations, how can you care for them rather than condemning them because they aren't doing what you think they should? Can you imagine how different things would be if we could put these two principles into practice? If as Christians, we would learn to care about our own sin more than the sins of the world around us, And if we were to care for other sinners rather than condemning them for their faults and shortcomings, listen, the reputation of the church would change. The quality of your relationships would strengthen. The kingdom of God would invade your home and office and our city and our church, and nothing would ever be the same. The only way that's ever gonna come about is if we learn to judge without being judgmental, and if we learn to care without condemning. Pray with me. God, we thank you for blessing us with so many relationships in our lives. And I'm praying right now that you can press on our heart, that we look on ourselves before we judge others. 
God, I'm praying that we would reflect on what we need to work on within our own lives instead of looking and pointing fingers. God, I, I pray that you would help us to strive every single day to believe the best in people. And God, I pray for opportunities to love well and love more. We praise you and we thank you. Amen. How do you know that God is reaching out to you and wants to make a difference in your life? Something is yearning, something is changing, but you're not really sure what's happening. I can tell you that even the people around you are making a difference. From that friend that invited you online or sent you this sermon, from the church that's just been ministering in your area, to whatever it is, God is just making a difference and pressing forward in your life. He wants a relationship with you. And that's what it's all about, that we have a direct relationship with God. We don't have to go in between. There's no one else, you and God. He knows you fully and completely, and He wants you to know Him too. So if you've decided to put your heart, your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ today, let us know. You can comment the word faith in the feed below, or you can text the number on the screen. Just text us the word faith. We would love to celebrate with you in this decision, in this step of faith. And we would love to send you a free Bible if you don't have one. So let us know you are not in this journey alone. Thanks, Amber. So you guys, listen, on September 3rd, that's gonna be a Thursday, we're having a worship night and team night. Now, if you've served on the Dream Team, definitely come. But if you've never served at Connect Church, it's okay, we want you to come as well. Because this night is where you can learn how to make a difference in the future. So if you've been curious and you want to add purpose and meaning to your spiritual life, this is the time to do it. It come to the worship night and team night that's going to happen on September 3rd at 7 p.m. We'll give you more details online, on Facebook and Instagram in the future, but write that date down. Also, we want to invite you to have the opportunity to give. We make such a difference worldwide with your offerings, with your gifts, um, spreading the gospel globally. But just so you know, we're working on getting a permanent location for Connect Church, a place to call home permanently. Come on, you guys. And because of your generous donations, you are helping make that possible. So thank you. You can go to connectcalgary.ca slash give to make a difference. Thanks so much for joining us. Live life overflowing. Chicken pot pie is lit, you guys. You were, no, okay. I don't like, I gotta change that line. Something has been yearning in your life. I'm gonna stop right there. <laughs>